I now call to order the Society's 2,457th meeting in what is now the 51st year since its founding on March 13th, 1871. Good evening, everyone. My name is Larry Milstein. I am the president of PSW, one of the oldest scientific societies of Washington, DC, committed to providing a forum to further scientific understanding and inquiry. Welcome to our members, guests, and friends to tonight's lecture by Elizabeth Strykowski. Tonight's meeting is being held via Zoom. As of now, we are planning to have the next meeting in person, but this will depend, of course, on COVID and on the measures instituted by government authorities and the Cosmos Club. The venue will be posted to the website and highlighted in the announcements that will be sent before the lecture. Please check the website frequently for updates. All in-person meetings will adhere to the Cosmos related rules of the District of Columbia and the Cosmos Club. Proof of vaccination, including a picture ID will be required for in-person attendance. Masking is now optional. And we suggest getting tested for COVID within 48 hours of the event. And these re requirements are subject to changes in the COVID related rules of DC and the Cosmos Club. So again, please check the PSW website often for up-to-date information. We'll, we will be live streaming all meetings to YouTube for our remote audience to enjoy and to ask questions in the YouTube chat box. And final versions of the recordings will be posted to the PSW website and to the PSW YouTube and Vimeo channels where they will be permanently available without charge for everyone to view. The society is grateful to the sponsors of the 2021, 2022 lecture series for their support. The Policy Studies Organization in cooperation with the American Public University and a generous donor who's asked to remain anonymous. Please join me in thanking them. Thank you, sponsors. I'm pleased to announce the following new members. Tonight's speaker, Elizabeth Strykowski, who learned of PSW from our invitation to her to speak tonight, whose interests will be clear in part from tonight's lecture. And we welcome her to membership. If you are not a member and you would like to join PSW or support the society, you can do so through the PSW website using the blue join button on the upper right hand corner of the home page. We welcome new members and we appreciate donations. Oh, we can now turn to tonight's speaker, Elizabeth Strychowski, and her lecture on living management systems and minimal cells. Elizabeth is group leader of the Cellular Engineering Group at the National Institute of Stances and Technology, fondly known as NIST. Before joining NIST, she was program manager in the Biological Technologies Office of DARPA. In her previous work at DARPA, Elizabeth managed a portfolio to aggressively advance experimental and theoretical research at the interface of synthetic biology, control engineering, nanobiotechnology and fluidic devices. She founded the Cellular Engineering Group at NIST to provide fundamental measurements to support the design and control of engineered function in living systems. Among other honors and awards, Elizabeth is the recipient of the University of Rochester's Fulbright Prize and its James Clerk, Janet Clerk Award. And she received the Maryland Academy of Sciences Young Scientist Award. Elizabeth earned a BS in Physics and Astronomy and a BA in Religious Studies at the University of Rochester and an MA and PhD in Physics at Cornell University. All questions will be fielded after the lecture during a Q&A session. Elizabeth, the screen is yours. Thank you so much. Good evening, everyone. I do need to start with a disclaimer that anything we talk about this evening 
does not imply recommendation or endorsement by NIST. So with that out of the way, um, and so that you understand my background and biases, I've spent time learning and thinking in my scientific career about astronomy, atomic and molecular optics, high energy physics, nanotechnology, analytical chemistry, and now most recently, synthetic and engineering biology. But more than any one of these areas, I like to think about metrology, which is the science of assessing value. And I like to think about measurement and uncertainty analysis as a, a distillation of what separates us from feral beasts in the wild. Now, some questions I like to ask and that we'll take up today are, how can we use biology itself to construct measurement tools for living systems? How can we engineer biology to better measure what separates a pile of chemistry from a living cell? But before we dive into the technical work that explores these questions, I'd like to consider the larger context of biotechnologies like synthetic and engineering biology. And this is the context that I find is missing from um, a lot of what you find out on the internet or people discussing about this new breakthrough or that new breakthrough. What's this bigger context? What are the stakes? Why does it matter? Why should we care? Um, what's the greater context for the living measurement systems and minimal cells we'll talk about today? And I also like to talk about this because this is very close to my experience as a scientist working in this research area. This is in the back of my mind whenever I step into my laboratory. So we are integral to the globe spanning success of biology. We all started as a single cell like this image on the left. And this is utterly ordinary. Now the image on the right is an electron micrograph of a particular genomically minimal cell that we'll talk about later called JCBI SYN 3.0. That's J. Craig Venter Institute for the JCBI. Now this cell is an extraordinary human achievement at the forefront of our ability to engineer and understand cellular life. Somewhere inside and between these lies us, our humanity, our evolutionary past, our future enabled by transformative biotechnologies. Now to understand the potential of biotechnology, I want to start here with physics. I, I did spend my scientific childhood with physicists and um, they do spend time making sure that we understand very clearly that we make existential decisions about technology whenever we step into the laboratory potentially. So I want to start with human hubris, with unconsidered consequences, with regret, with the real sense that we're capable of getting ourselves into existential trouble. Biotechnology is like this. I wanna argue, in no small part, because we're made of the same stuff as biotechnology. And so we have to collectively decide what world we wanna create for ourselves with these capabilities. So the issues of what we could do, what we should do, and what we will do are at the heart of developments in biotechnology today and the future we choose to make for ourselves. Now this discussion is not where we're going this evening, but I think it's important to own our tremendous responsibility in this. So having uh, gotten the terrible power of biotechnology out of the way, I wanna to turn to just how amazing it is. I don't wanna be blase about the state of our capabilities. Consider something we take entirely for granted, commercial passenger flight. This is of course routine, but that doesn't mean we have to become routinized to the fact that we sit calmly in chairs hurtling through the literal stratosphere. That's amazing. And the impacts of it are so much more than just putting people in chairs in the sky. Personally, I find biotechnology to be a lot like this. Transforming genes between bacteria or other organisms like air travel is entirely routine, but I don't wanna become routinized to the fact that we can with intent read and write the very DNA expressed inside of living cells. That is also amazing. And the impact of it is already so much more than fluorescent fish in your home aquarium. Take CAR T cancer therapies, for example. Now, by the way, in case you missed this news article, these transgenic glowfish have been found in the wild in Brazil, which highlights issues of biocontainment that are very real. This is also not where our discussion is going today, but again, it's worth keeping in mind. 
Now to get us a little closer to where we are going today in our discussion, consider the schematic that shows what are generally agreed to be the various technological revolutions of humankind. You have steam engines, mass production, you have the automation, computing, and information revolution. Um, you have where we spend our everyday lives, the, um, the internet of things and artificial intelligence. And then there's this last one where we find ourselves now in our discussion of living measurement systems and minimal cells. Some argue that we're seeing the development of the foundational technologies that will drive the next technological revolution. Of course, it's the biotechnological revolution. Synthetic and engineering biology are central to this. My hope is that this framing of the state of the art in biotechnology gives you a sense for how our discussion today relates to all of the other technology we take for granted in every moment of our lives as technological beings. Our experience individually and as a society, it's absolutely pervaded by our technological capabilities. So that's where we are, but where will all of this biotechnological capability take us in the future. Now, while most engineering biology still happens in laboratory settings, the future will see these move outside of the laboratory. Because I believe that, you know, whether we like it or not, we will absolutely need to more extensively field biotechnology. And hopefully we'll be able to do this in time to solve some of the pressing challenges uh, in our environment and in human health for nothing short of uh, ensuring our long-term survival, to put it plainly. Now, if we can allow ourselves some freedom to dream, we can envision influencing entire planetary systems to better support human life. Although this image is meant to be Mars, we can imagine proving out terraforming capabilities on smaller targets like comets or asteroids or moons. My hope is that we'll get a chance to do this before there's a dire need for those technologies back here on Earth. My point with all this is that in many ways, we're arguably more limited right now by our imagination than by our ability to do things in the laboratory. So if you can do anything, what do you do? Well, I know that we can only build the future that we can envision together. And this takes us right back to issues of what we could do, what we should do and what we will do. And we all have the responsibility to ourselves and to each other to help shape this. Of course, we all want a future that's worth living and we don't wanna leave anyone behind. All of this is what I think about every time I step into the laboratory. So with this backdrop, let's move to a more technical discussion. And of course, I don't wanna claim undue credit. The work I'll talk about um, today describes the contribution of many talented researchers and collaborators across more than a decade. With apologies to anyone I've missed um, and forgotten to include on this slide. So my group, my research group lives at NIST, which is the National Metrological Institute of the United States. And it's part of the Department of Commerce because if you can't agree on weights and measures, you can't trade. And a core part of our mission is to focus on metrology, which is again, that study of assessing value. I happen to be located in something called the Material Measurement Laboratory where our engineering biology program is centered. But research supporting measurements, equipment, and data management relevant to biological systems happens in nearly all of these labs. So when people think of NIST, they tend to focus on standards like how much does a kilogram weigh or how long is a second? Um, but we need standards for measurements of biological systems too. And I invite you to consider the incredible amount of technical work and stakeholder engagement that has to occur well before we come to the top of this pyramid to creating um, and using a standard. Now, as a technology area matures, we tend to build up this pyramid. Engineering and synthetic biology are rapidly developing fields and they tend to still inhabit mostly the lower portions of this pyramid. Um, and my group typically works closer to that area. But identifying and meeting measurement needs early um, speeds filling out this pyramid, which in turn supports the success of all of the academic research that's happening out there in synthetic and engineering biology, along with 
transitioning those technologies to industry so that it can impact the bioeconomy more broadly. So NIST is developing measurement products that are enabling the predictive design, engineering, manufacturing, and translation of emerging biotechnologies. And I like to think of that road to realizing our future bioeconomy as paved with measurement innovation and measurement assurance for both biology and engineering biology. These are generally advancing together from discovery and innovation to knowledge and capability, and finally, prediction and control. Now, ultimately, Control is essential for achieving this vision of engineering biology that um, is shared broadly in the field. It's this vision of realizing the routine ability to design and build safe, well-characterized um, systems uh, for a desired purpose with a predictive function. So let's consider what Let's consider the impact of even a small amount of control over engineered biological parts can have, along with control over their combined function. Now here, when I say a part, I usually mean an engineered sequence of DNA that encodes for a functional biomolecule. So for example, it might be a protein that senses uh, a molecule of interest. Control is the difference between on the left, piling up rocks at the edge of your field so that your cows can graze and you just happen to end up with a stone wall versus human mastery over the elements with the Roman aqueducts or you know, giving expression to humanity's cultural artistry in Hagia Sophia. Because chances are very small that while you're clearing your field for your cows to graze, you're gonna come across something like a keystone. And chances are even smaller that you're gonna know what to do with it to start making arches. So the difference between the left and right of this, of this slide is the difference between some qualitative outcome, you got a pile of rocks, to some deliberate and quantitative outcome. So how do we better arrive at uh, you know, a, our ability to control these parts so that we can make custom parts built for purpose like a keystone? How do we control what those parts do individually and in concert with each other? And because this is biology and so challenging, we also need to consider what happens when that context that those parts are in changes. So to support this objective, we recently founded a new group at NIST with the mission of providing a foundation of good measurements to support control and rational design of biological function, all driving towards something that we're calling precision engineering biology. And if this sounds a lot like controlling the life force, you wouldn't be wrong. So we develop living measurement systems to enable control. These are biological parts and circuits to measure biology that enable us to implement control strategies. Now, I would argue living measurement systems are the right technology for the job. They're compatible, and they scale uh, favorably with the biological systems we're trying to measure and engineer. And we also know that it's possible to build living measurement systems because biology is measuring and controlling itself all the time at every level. Now, I'm emphasizing this because there are other folks who are using abiotic parts to measure living systems. For example, you have research around um, people making uh, nanomachines using semiconductor electronics, for example, and inserting these into living systems. That's all tremendously interesting and useful research. That's not what we're talking about here. So, so what happens in a cellular engineering group? <laughs> well, I'd like to briefly introduce three areas my group is working on to advance living measurement systems and control towards fulfilling our group mission. And this will lead us directly to our discussion of minimal cells. So this first area is sensors. If you can't sense, then you don't know what your system is doing and you can't correct that function or output. In other words, you can't implement control. The second area is computation. When you can process on information from multiple inputs coming from the environment or internal to the cell, you greatly increase your options for control, for actuating functions of interest, for reading out measurement results and so on. The third area 
are chassis, which is um, synthetic biology jargon for your living system, usually a cell type. Now we use typical various lab strains of E. coli and yeast. We also use cell-free systems and genomically minimal cells. And we use these to come with the problem of what is life? How can we control it? And what are the boundaries of what it can do for us? So stated differently, those questions are, what is a given biological system? Sort of what's its identity? What can it do? What functions does it offer us in its current form? And what could it do? What are the possibilities or opportunities for engineering the system to do other things for us? So starting with sensors, this is NIST's first biofoundry. This is our living measurement systems foundry. This is part of our larger push to modernize and automate our biological labs at NIST. And I love this photograph because it just shows you the stark contrast between maybe some of the bio labs that we knew from past days that look like uh, rows of benches with pipetters um, and you know everybody has their station. You've got your vortexer. I mean, now you walk into a bio lab and so much of the floor space is devoted to automation. And we needed to do this to serve our industrial stakeholders who are of course leveraging automation wherever they can. Um, but also at the smaller scale, more folks are understanding that to take full advantage of some of the developments in machine learning and AI um, and to ask more sophisticated questions of biological systems, you really have to access the throughput you can get with automation. So this particular system um, is designed in a flexible way for an improved approach uh, to directed evolution. And, and I mentioned it's a flexible system because we don't wanna make the same measurement a million times. We wanna make a million different measurements. So ultimately we wanna drive our automation in a loop where our high throughput experimental results feed into our machine learning methods that we're developing that then make predictions that are used to design the next iteration of our experiments. So this was our intention. Um, but what we've found so far is that we've gotten so much high quality data from just one iteration that we really haven't had yet to do more. Um, I'm sure we'll get there. Um, just we've been having such fun analyzing the data we've already gotten um, that we haven't had to move on from that yet. So, we started with a directed evolution workflow, adding a step because we're NIST <laughs> where we measure everything. So to remind you, directed evolution um, won the Nobel Prize in Chemistry in 2018. And it usually involves creating a large library of many variants of a DNA sequence, encoding for some biological molecule or function of interest. So you're sampling a large space of DNA sequences that kind of live adjacent to what you anticipate um, this function is that you wanna access. Now in the directed evolution workflow, you typically only select a few winners and then you throw the rest of your library away, which seems wasteful. So we thought, well, what if we just measure the performance of every one of those variants? So that's what we did. Now to prove out our new workflow, we focused on a system that is very well known to um, biologists, the lac I system in E. coli that can be induced with a molecule called uh, IPTG. So we constructed a large library of randomly modified DNA sequences that encode for slightly different versions of our protein sensor of interest. We put these into our bacteria and then we measured the response of each sensor to many concentrations of an inducer molecule. So this project had two main outcomes. One, by measuring everything, we can discover novel function. That is, we could find what we weren't looking for or that we wouldn't know to look for just by looking at naturally evolved systems. Now in this example, we inadvertently rediscovered what we're calling band stop sensors. And you can see those over on the right-hand side of, of the slide. As far as we could tell, they had been forgotten in the literature. They were certainly unknown to us before our measurements. The second outcome of this project is that we're enabling precision engineering biology, um, either by simply mining our data from this large landscape mapping genotype to phenotype that we get by our measure everything approach. We can simply 
choose in silico DNA sequences that match our desired performance for our sensor. Or we can start really forward engineering by learning sequence function design rules using machine learning and then predicting DNA sequences that will give us the sensor we want. We then simply order that sensor or the DNA that encodes that sensor from the DNA store, essentially, <laughs> and then put it into our organism of interest. In this case, it was our E. coli. And then verifying that we did, yes, in fact, get the sensor function um, that we had predicted. I do want to note that um, in addition to the technical manuscript, we are publishing our detailed protocols on Protocols.io, and we're sharing our information methods on GitHub. We're also a member of the Global Biofoundry Alliance. We're very happy to share our experience and advice on automating synthetic biology protocols. And I, I don't mean to imply that um, we're completely doing away with um, manual wet lab work. That's not at all the case. Um, you do still need to um, have that as an integral component of developing uh, your protocols as you transition them to automation. If you even decide that's the way you need to go. Automation is not always the answer, as we'll see a little bit later. Moving on now to computation. Um, my lab recently demonstrated something called co-transcriptional RNA strand displacement circuits, which is a mouthful, <laughs> CTRSD. These take the power and straightforward programmability of DNA computing and implement it as genetically encoded RNA circuits based on toehold strand displacements. So the colored lines here represent nucleic acids and toehold strand displacement happens when short single-stranded segments or toeholds complement another strand that displaces the strand that's currently bound through this process called branch migration. Now, what's different about um, our circuits is that they're transcribed in situ and they're transcribed continuously. This was not possible before with, um, with DNA computing. And our system is compatible with use in vivo. So you can imagine then a cell monitoring its internal state in real time for all of the reasons you might wanna have this capability. For example, for cells making products or for cells as products. Um, you might want um, a cell that monitors uh, dynamically its yield in a biomanufacturing process and then actuates some kind of response based on that measurement to optimize that yield. Or you might want your cells to diagnose themselves with cancer as early as possible. The idea is to take the entire measurement pipeline and move it out of our laboratories and in silico computers and instead use biomolecules to build that same measurement pipeline all within a living cell. So that's the vision for this project. So, so far, we've demonstrated both single layer Boolean logic and amplification circuits. This is in vitro, this work. So what you're seeing here are some schematics of some different gates and an amplification circuit. And then these plots are showing um, the increase in a fluorescent signal as the circuits react um, over time. So I, I show these plots because I wanted to give you a sense for the time scale over which these circuits are working. So tens of minutes. But this is very typical of computing in a biological system. I mean, you're not gonna win any speed awards. Um, we've also demonstrated multi-layer cascades. So these were developed along with a simple model that allowed us to predict and design circuit performance, that code is available. Um, and we're also working now on testing design rules we can share with other laboratories for these circuits. We also wanna build other types of computations beyond Boolean logic. Um, and one of the reasons for that is Boolean logic is very foreign to biological systems. Um, we like it because we're used to thinking of computation happening in silico. Um, but taking further inspiration from, from advances in, in, in silico computing, we can now start to think about building machine learning out of biological parts in living systems, even though they were really, that was originally inspired by living systems. It's so wonderfully meta. So moving on now to chassis. 
one of the biological systems we work with are cell-free systems. These are reactions where you essentially take the innards of a population of cells, often E. coli, you remove the DNA from those cells so that you can then add in a DNA template of your choosing, along with any other reagents you might want or need, for example, a source of energy or any of the other things listed on this slide. There are three common reasons why you might want to use cell-free systems. You might want to use it itself as a platform because you want to harness the functionality of biology without, needing, without the system needing to be fully alive. For example, you might want to produce a product that would be toxic to a living cell. Another reason is that you might want to use cell-free as an intermediate tool for testing, say, genetic parts. Um, as, you, as you develop uh, an engineered part. Um, and one way people talk about this is, is speeding the design build test or design build test learn cycle, which is something that um, synthetic biology and engineering biology have borrowed from other engineering disciplines. The idea is that if your system doesn't have to be alive all the time while you're testing it, then you're not constantly waiting for your cells to grow up. You can just quickly whip up this cell-free system and have your answer in a few hours instead of a few days. A third reason is that you might be trying to construct something like a, synth a synthetic cell, which sometimes can involve um, re-encapsulating cell-free systems in an artificial membrane, for example. Or uh, it's not done as commonly, although I personally think there's a lot of really interesting work to do here, is to reintroduce engineered confinement using fluidic chips like microfluidic and nanofluidic chips. So we're working to provide measurement support for all of these use cases. Reproducibility has been a challenge for these systems in research settings. Um, so that's something we've been looking at. Um, we've been focusing on testing manual and automated protocols for preparing that DNA template I mentioned and quantifying the resulting amount and variability of protein expression that results off of that DNA template. Now, interestingly, as we go uh, kind of head-to-head -head manual and automated protocols, we find that automation is not always a better option than a manual process if you're looking to reduce variability in your protein production. But there are other trade-offs. You know, automation is going to give you faster throughput, for example. But it turns out that a human is actually really good at pipetting reproducibly. So now, <laughs> We are also developing in-house automated methods for preparing that cell lysate, for encapsulating it, all because we want to speed part testing and validation. We want to enable testing and comparison of the function of an engineered biological part anywhere along the spectrum from chemistry to cellular life. And our most immediate need for this is to help us take those RNA circuits, those CTRSD circuits, uh, from our in vitro setting where they're working to an in vivo setting. And, um, I can tell you that we're not the only ones who have found it extremely challenging to take a part that's been developed and tested in vitro and try to get it to work at all in vivo. So we're hoping that we can develop a reporter scheme that works well across all these systems so that we have that as a measurement tool we can share with other labs. And we can um, use that as a way to um, kind of test what goes wrong as the context that these systems are operating in that we've engineered gets more complex. Okay, so those are some of the projects happening in the cellular engineering group and I'd be happy to go into more detail on any of them. Um, but now I'd like to move on to minimal cellular life. <laughs> so thank you for indulging me thus far. Um, I hope to ultimately be able to engineer a platform using minimal cells um, for developing and testing living measurement systems. Now, more broadly, minimal cells have been um, a dream of the scientific community for at least 100 years. A group of scientists formed the Phage Society in the 1930s, and they thought deeply on the concept of a minimal cell. Later in the 1980s, mycoplasma were suggested as an ideal naturally evolved cell type to use as a starting point for creating a minimal cell. And researchers have been asking, can we throw away functions and biomolecular parts until only the essentials remain? What would be left? 
what does a minimal cell still have to accomplish to stay alive? Now, this is one list of essential cellular processes, according to John Glass at the J. Craig Venture Institute, JCDI. Um, and he led the development of the minimal cell we'll talk about today. What I find so interesting about this list is that, you know, very complex phenotypes like a dividing cell are on here, but you don't see evolution anywhere. And I asked John about this and he said that, well, but that just happens because biomolecular parts of cells and their interactions aren't perfect. I, I suppose the alternative would be that that cell just gives up and stops living, um, which doesn't seem very lifelike. There's also the issue of what minimal cells might tell us about our last unicellular common ancestor. And you know, how can we use minimal cells to learn about the origins of life itself? Now, conversely, how can we use what we learn about phylogeny to inform our ability to better engineer minimal and synthetic cells? These are all open questions, which I find really interesting. Um, and I'm hoping that as more people become familiar with not just the idea of the minimal cell in general, but this minimal cell in particular, they may see it as a potential experimental system for, for looking into some of these questions. Okay. Now, personally, to help ground the discussion a little bit, I find it helpful to situate the minimal cell today within the broader landscape of cellular engineering. Now, in this landscape, we can consider four types of cells. There are naturally evolved cells. These are the organisms you find out in nature. There are cells that have been edited intentionally. So you impose some rational design, for example, through gene editing techniques like CRISPR. You can also exploit biological processes to grow up many different varieties. This is like that DNA library we talked about and simply screen for some function you want and then select that cell to continue um, propagation. Or you may find yourself in a position where you have full mastery of cellular life. And so you can synthesize cells that may be lineage agnostic, that is cells that didn't come from other cells in the way that all these other cells came from other cells. So in this case, you might just generate your genome on a computer, send it off to get assembled. You might add some chemistry and you've got a cell. That's the vision. So to focus in on synthetic cells, oh, I should mention too that these four types of cells are of course not mutually exclusive. To focus in on synthetic cells, um, there are generally considered to be two main approaches to creating them. Some researchers pursue um, a bottom-up approach, which has not yet to my knowledge been fully realized experimentally. The idea here is to assemble functioning cells molecule by molecule until the system meets the definition of life. So I like to think of this as additive biology. JCVI's minimal cells are instead examples of a top-down approach. Here, the idea is to remove parts from an already functioning cell until it just barely meets the definition of life. I like to think of this as subtractive biology. Now, moving forward, there's of course, tremendous opportunity in also combining these two approaches. So I hope you have a better sense for where the minimal cell now lives in the broader context of biotechnologies and also cellular engineering. So let's focus in on JCVI's minimal cell now. What capabilities were needed to arrive at these minimal cells through this top-down approach? The JCVI had to develop several technologies that together enabled building cells with synthetic and minimized genomes. So first, genome synthesis was, was published by Dan Gibson and colleagues in 2010. The genomes were synthesized from oligonucleotides and the last assembly steps were done in yeast. What's really powerful about this is that the genomes did not have to pass through any viable intermediates. And that lets you make very large genetic changes all at once, instead of kind of adiabatic changes to the genome, where you need to make sure that the cell is still functioning and alive at every step. Now, once you've synthesized the genome, you've got to express it. 
So the second capability is genome transplantation. Um, and that was published by Carol Artigue and colleagues in 2009. So the donor genome is isolated from a yeast nucleus and then transplanted into a phylogenetic related, phylogenetically related bacterium. And the reason it needs to be related is if, they, if they're too distant, then that recipient cell won't know what to do with that donor genome. It won't be able to make those proteins. You block recombination between the donor and recipient bacteria, bacteria um, so that you can select for only the donor genome. And once only that donor genome remains, then all new proteins are encoded by that donor genome. And within something like 10 generations, you have a recipient cell that's basically been recoded by that donor genome to have proteins made off of that donor genome. So you've got a reprogrammed cell. Now, as an aside, <laughs> genome transplantation remains, um, I think, one of the most significant bottlenecks to building many different synthetic cells at scale. We have all of this capability to, to synthesize and assemble genes and genomes, but it's very challenging to get those into cells such, and, then, and then make sure that they're functional. So as far as genome transplantation goes, to my knowledge, it's not yet been automated. The yields are low and it requires talented researchers in the lab. This is a situation of magic hands. <laughs> Part of the challenge is, of course, that megabase pair DNA, like whole genomes, they're fragile under shear forces during liquid handling. There are researchers using automated um, protocols with minimal cells, but in my experience, these cells are not very robust to liquid handling. We also don't understand the physical and biological mechanisms that yield a successful genome transplantation. So we have a protocol that works. We don't know why it works. And that makes optimization and generalization to other organisms very challenging. The third capability is bringing in this engineering workflow using design, build, test, or design, build, test, learn cycles. So in 2016, Clyde Hutchinson and colleagues, including NIST, used this approach to develop a cell with a minimal genome. NIST was involved uh, specifically in providing measurements of the genome transplantation process and of the resulting phenotypes of the cells during minimization. Okay, so these capabilities were applied to an organism called Mycoplasma mycoides. So Mycoplasma, again, they were suggested in this paper in uh, I think 1984 as an appropriate organism for genome minimization because these organisms come pre-minimized by nature. They've lost genetic uh, complexity during adaptation to life as an obligate parasite. Now this particular organism happens to be an opportunistic pathogen of goats. Um, it is an obligate parasite, so it can just import complex metabolites from the host instead of needing to retain that genetic complexity to make um, those metabolites itself. Um, but that means that in the laboratory, it does require a complex growth media because it wants to think that it's still in that goat. Um, one thing that is important about it is that it lacks a cell wall. Now, many bacteria do have a cell wall, but this one, this one doesn't. So just file that away. That's important for later. To give you a sense of scale, here's mycoplasma mycoides shown roughly to scale with uh, an E. coli cell and a bacteriophage. So they're, these are quite small, these cells. So you have your mycoplasma mycoides genome at 898 genes. You've printed your JCVI SYN 1.0 with 901 genes. So the JCVI synthesized a version of the mycoplasma mycoides genome and transplanted it into a related species, Capricolum, and that gave us SYN 1.0. Now at the time, I believe this um, paper calls this a synthetic cell. Now that's not, that's not the vocabulary we would use today. It wouldn't be considered a synthetic cell. The DNA sequence of SYN 1.0 largely mirrors the sequence of wild type mycoplasma mycoides. Okay. So a subset of the genome of 1.0 gives us 3.0. And by the way, yes, there was a JCVI SYN 2.0 during the minimization process. Remember I talked about cycles of design, build, test, learn. And one of the questions um, that inevitably comes up is why was the minimal cell developed using these eight 
genome segments shown in the schematic, and you'll see that in the paper. Well, it turns out that there's something called synthetic lethality that was a major challenge for genome minimization. And it reflects how gene essentiality depends on genomic context. Okay. Um, and by the way, the fact that there are eight genome segments, I, I asked about this and uh, it was, you know, instead of seven or nine and, and it was an arbitrary decision. I, I just personally, I'm so fascinated at how these decisions get made in the laboratory and um, you're making them all the time. And so many of them have this element of arbitrariness about it. Can I admit that? <laughs> um, but, you know, they can have useful consequences later on. <laughs> so synthetic lethality can happen when multiple genes redundantly serve the same function. So consider an airplane with two engines. Removing either one of its engines still allows that plane to fly. So you might consider the engines is not essential. However, if you simultaneously remove both engines, your plane can't fly. That's synthetic lethality. So one strategy that JCVI used to overcome this challenge was to assemble the genome from eight, these eight overlapping segments. And then they minimized each segment independently and then mixed and matched to delete as many genes as possible. So they tested each of these minimized segments in the larger gen genomic context of the unminimized JCVI SYN 1.0. So in addition to being the organism with the smallest genome that can grow in axionic culture, that is grow in isolation in the lab, JCVI SYN 3.0 represents the first realization of that concept of the minimal cell as it was proposed originally by those scientists back in the 1930s. This is an amazing achievement. This was absolutely a biotechnological tour de force. And the fact that we can sit here calmly and have a nice evening discussing it, um, seems almost incredible to me because this was such a wild scientific ride. Um, and I think I joined sometime in about 2014 or 20, 2015. Um, and this has of course been an effort that's been ongoing for well over a decade. That's how hard it is. Okay. So we can compare the growth of JCVI SYN 1.0 and JCVI SYN 3.0. Now we see that 3.0 has a slower but still reasonable doubling time of about 180 minutes, and it produces colonies that are morphologically similar to JCVI SYN 1.0. And if you've never seen a, a mycoplasma colony, they look just like this. They're sitting on an agar plate. They have this nice round structure. Sometimes they're called a, like a fried egg shape. Um, but there's nothing about these images of SYN 3.0 as a colony that suggests anything strange. So JCVI SYN 3.0 was optimized for minimal genome size with the constraint of fast growth at the population scale and confirmed by population scale measurements. This then inadvertently left whatever was happening at the single cell scale essentially completely unconstrained. I'm just gonna pause there. And this is what happened. <laughs> Scanning electron and optic, uh, micrographs and optical images uh, confirmed that the single cell morphology was in fact not constrained during minimization. Um, so the morphology of SYN 3.0 as a single cell scale is much more heterogeneous than 1.0. And uh, at the time, JCVI came to us and they said, well, we can't figure out if the small things are coming from the big things or the big things are coming from the small things. Can you help us? <laughs> now, fundamentally, this raises interesting questions around the connection between genotype and cell growth and division. For example, control of cell morphology is evidently not a requirement for genomically minimal cellular life. Who knew? So what else might we be wrong about? What other assumptions and biases do we bring to our attempts to understand and, and engineer cellular life that we might wanna reinvestigate or reconsider? Now, practically, this poses problems associated with trying to study and engineer cells that don't have reproducible characteristics at the single cell scale. You know, if you wanna take a physicist approach of perturbing a system and watching its response, it helps to know what you expect from the system before you perturb it. You certainly can't make predictive design choices to engineer the function of your cell if you don't know what it's doing 
and why it's doing it. So, so JCVI and their collaborators asked NIST for a way to measure the dynamics of single cell growth and investigate what genes are required for normal morphology. But why was this measurement hard? I'm showing you here electron micrographs, but that requires fixing the cells, meaning that you've treated them with chemicals such that they're no longer alive. You're basically looking at their carcasses. If you want to image live cells, these cells are non-adherent. That is, they're not going to stay still nicely for you to image them. And again, they're really small. So that means, one, they're going to diffuse around pretty quickly. And um, they're about the same size as the wavelengths of light that you're using to look at them. And that's completely aside from any other imaging issues like uh, phototoxicity that we saw. So, so what to do? We developed microfluidic chemostats for this purpose. Um, we deliberately kept the fluidic devices very simple. They consist of a single main microchannel with many smaller growth chambers along um, its length for cell culture and imaging and no moving parts. Um, the device is molded into PDMS or polydimethylsiloxane. This is basically a clear version of bathroom caulk. We bond it to cover glass and then we image it on a wide field epifluorescence microscope. Um, it was really helpful that um, we had as part of this project, one of the developers of the so-called mother machine devices that have been developed for E. coli that you can see in this video on the lower left. So, he brought that experience to um, our, our design and fabrication of the microfluidic chemostats for the mycoplasma. Now, just like the mother machine devices for E. coli, in our devices, small molecules like food and waste simply diffuse between that main channel and our growth chamber over a period of seconds, so it's very rapid. Importantly, our device creates a sheer fluid free environment for cell growth. That's why we need those chambers isolated from the main channel that has uh, growth media flowing through it. So remember, these cells have no cell wall, and we wanna be sure that any morphologies we see result from processes intrinsic to the cell and not because of anything external that we've imposed um, through the extracellular environment. Um, this is what the uh, experimental setup looked like on our optical microscope. Um, so you can see our microscope, you can see our incubator. Um, there's an arrow showing where we put our microfluidic chemostats. We have syringe pumps um, where syringes are loaded with, uh, with our growth media or fluorescent solutions. And tubing is then run onto the microscope. Um, and then the image on the right shows kind of a close in. Um, the chip itself is maybe, <coughs> excuse me, 50 to, to 70 millimeters long. Um, so you can just hold it in your fingers. And then each chip has multiple tubes coming in and out because we have at least three channels with hundreds of chambers on each channel running for each experiment. We need at least one control um, channel, and then we might be testing two different strains. Uh, of um, minimized cells in any experiment, which we would run overnight. I think it's always fun to give a sense for, you know, if you were the scientists walking into the, the laboratory with you, know, what do you walk up to? And this is what we walked up to. Um, there's also a biosafety cabinet uh, next to this setup because these are BSL-2 organisms. So to give you a sense of scale, here's a typical mycoplasma colony, that big orange circle on an agar plate, shown actual size with one of our microfluidic chambers. So these microfluidic chemostats extend our ability to engineer the minimal cell at not only the colony scale, but also the single cell scale, because we now have a way to measure that. Um, okay. So how did our cells grow? in our microfluidic chemostats. As a control, these time-lapse images show the growth of JCVI SYN 1.0 cells. You're seeing phase contrast in the upper image and then um, constitutively expressed M. cherry in the cytoplasm um, 
in the lower image. So you can see there's kind of a, a uniform sense to the floor. So I, I want to mention too that it's not just, you know, it's not that we are bad at doing optical microscopy. <laughs> it's that um, our chambers are three microns deep. And at this magnification, it means that the cells are not always um, in focus as we image them. They're also very small. So they're going to look a little blurry. Okay. So that's what 1.0 looks like. In contrast, since 3.0 cells grow to include cells with a lot of morphological variation, including cellular structures that are several microns in diameter. We have filamentous cells, we have other shapes. I'm gonna let this loop a few times so you can pick out um, some of what's happening here. And again, this is just one of hundreds of chambers. You could even see in the, in the lower um, fluorescent image that some of these cell-like objects are brighter than others. Some appear not to be metabolically active. They don't have an m cherry signal. Um, you can see in the upper image, there are all these long filamentous cells, which are so fascinating to me because there are no known cytoskeletal elements in these cells. So what is stabilizing those long structures? Because you would expect that the membrane would kind of pinch off and you would get isolated cells. So I'm not sure exactly what's happening there. So that's a fun mystery we still need to learn more about. Okay. In addition to variation in cell size and shape, SYN 3.0 cells also vary in their biomolecular composition. For example, some have more or less DNA, or as I mentioned, lack um, metabolic activity to express M. cherry. So at the end of a growth experiment, we could flow in fluorescent labels to visualize DNA, membranes. Um, we could put fluorescent media additives to test membrane permeability. Um, there's a lot of potential to use our chemostats for learning more about the minimal cell phenotype and about um, its, its biochemical makeup. But for right now, what I'd like to do is turn to uh, which genes are required for normal cell division. We hypothesized that JCV Isen 3.0 lacks the genes it needs to control cell division simply because they were deemed non-essential and kind of thrown away from the genome. Um, I should admit that there is uh, an alternate possible explanation that uh, maybe this, the cell is simply overexpressing genes such that it perturbs its ability um, to divide normally. Um, that is not a possibility that we, we looked at because it just seemed so obvious that uh, probably the bigger effect was that we got rid of something that needed to get put back in. So we first tested minimized versions of those one eighth genome segments in the context of an otherwise unminimized JCV Isen 1.0 genome. And those are the micrographs you're seeing here. Only the minimized segment six caused the abnormal cell division that we saw in SYN 3.0. So you can see that kind of down in that uh, lower left-hand corner there of the the micrographs. Granted, something's happening with segment two, but we really zeroed in on segment six. What that did for us is that it restricted our search from the 428 genes that were removed from SYN 1.0 to make SYN 3.0 to only the 76 genes missing from the minimized segment six. So that was hugely uh, helpful for us. Okay, and this is my favorite video. <laughs> Um, this is a very striking video that shows the overnight propagation of one of those cells. It has a minimized segment six in the genomic context of SYN 1.0. And uh, this is what happened. So it started with a single cell. You get this long filament. I don't even know what those dark things are. Uh, I'm going to let that play through again. This is one of our most exciting videos. Um, our uh, chips seem to have jumped position a little bit um, during, the, uh, during the experiment. So that's why you see that kind of shift right there. Okay, so we were able to focus in on segment six by creating many versions of segment six, each with different combinations of those 76 genes removed from segment six to generate 3.0. 
Empirically, we arrived then at a strain called JCBI sin 3 a It's 493 genes. Um, it has 19 genes not in the minimal version of segment six, and it shows nearly normal cell division. I'm emphasizing sin 3 a because it's the most widely used strain among the dozens of labs now doing research with this minimal cell. So if you dig into the literature, um, you'll come across sin 3 a and, and this is where it comes from. Now these time-lapse images um, show that pleomorphic growth um, of cells with a minimized segment six in the 1.0 context, genomic context, compared to the more normal growth of SYN3A. Now, is SYN3A perfect? No. Is it a lot better than 3.0? Absolutely. Okay, so which of these 19 genes is most essential to controlling cell division? So these 19 genes were then organized into eight clusters, not to be confused with the eight one eighth genome segments from earlier. <laughs> um, they were put into these clusters uh, where, to organize adjacent genes um, and they could represent transcriptional units. So we then studied the intact clusters first before we studied the, the, uh, the genes individually. So we first hypothesized that cell division depended on um, that gene cluster number one. That's part of um, a very highly conserved division and cell wall cluster. Um, don't get confused by that name, even though this cell does not have a cell wall, this cluster is just called division cell wall cluster. It's involved in, in cell division in many bacteria. This contains um, the tubulin homologue, FTSZ, uh, which forms filaments that tend to localize to the division site in many bacteria and form something called a Z ring. So we hypothesized that addition of this cluster alone to JCBI SYN 3.0 would restore normal cell division. Great, let's test it. But, <laughs> It did not restore normal cell division. The cells still seem to lack size and shape control as you can see from this micrograph, uh, which is not from our microfluidic hemostats. This is just a wet mount on a glass slide. And okay, so not cluster one, but when we look at all the rest of the clusters, there are no genes that stand out to us as offering any hints that they might be required for normal cell division. Um, I wanna point out also, um, under functional category in the table, a lot of these genes have unknown functions. And um, when I first came to biology, this was very shocking to me that there were so many genes of unknown function, even in organisms that are routine laboratory workhorses. Um, and we have the opportunity now through studies like the one we're talking about here um, to have an organism where, where we can, we, we're getting very close to hopefully understanding the function of every gene in that genome. This is one of the holy grails of cellular biology. Um, there's a lot of work to do before we get there, but I think we can see now how we can get there. Okay, so what to do? We turn to a more systematic approach and Liji Sun at the JCVI led a Herculean effort to make so many strains of, of this minimal cell. She used several genome engineering techniques to test different combinations of genes and clusters and then individually and then, and then image them. Um, and I, I wanna pause here too, to point out that you'll notice that it's very late in the study that we're coming to anything that could be called a systematic approach. And I think that future studies, and we talked about this in this collaboration as well, there's a lot of room for bringing rigorous design of experiments into biology more fully. And if we can, especially if we can couple that to automation, um, I think there's a lot of potential for minimal cell studies plus rigorous design of experiments to 
answer um, a lot of questions about what those genes of unknown function are doing um, and uh, maybe meet some other engineering targets that people might have for the system. Okay. So what did we find? With the search, we were able to identify seven genes. These include two known cell division genes, FTSC and CEPF. There's a hydrolase of unknown substrate and four genes that encode what we think are membrane associated proteins, also of unknown function. These are all required together to restore a normal phenotype similar to JCVISIN 1.0. And that's the strain you see here. That's 3.0 plus seven genes. Um, you'll also see it in the literature as um, JCV Isen 3.0 plus 126, naming the clusters that were added back. And it makes sense that cell division requires changes to the membrane, but the molecular mechanisms remain unclear. And our study was not designed to, to go after those molecular mechanisms, to understand what they were. So that's sort of beyond the scope of our study, as we like to say when we write the paper. Okay, so, so what to do? How can we get a better understanding of what's happening inside our minimal cell to, to um, better engineer back normal cell division to find out what those genes of unknown function are doing? Now, there are a lot of different formalisms and frameworks that can help us understand relationships between genotypes and phenotypes in any cellular system, but you know, uh, in minimal cells also. So how can we go from the expressed genotype, that is the, the, um, the proteome, to the phenotype, in this case, of uh, a dividing SYN3A cell or dividing minimal cell? And again, I'm trained as a physicist, so the first place I wanna look are at theories and models that we have from physics because we have a simplified model here. You know, this is our cellular spherical cow. We've got our minimal cell. Um, so, so why not take a step back from the genes and ask just as a physical object, what mechanical forces are acting on the membrane that could drive constriction and scission during cell division? Now, we have another model of systems that they're not cells, they're, they're vesicles, um, they're lipid membranes surrounding some fluid. They can provide a starting point for membrane mechanics. Um, these shapes shown here uh, were adapted from a model for vesicles that predicts that under certain conditions, vesicles can constrict and divide in the absence of any specialized machinery, like a Z-ring that we talked about. Now, if this is true for vesicles, then couldn't it also be true for a minimal cell? that lacks any confirmed division mechanism? In other words, how much of cell division is governed by the biophysics of the cell as a collection of biomolecules versus being driven as an active process regulated by the cell that consumes energy? Uh, this is an open question, um, but I think it's a fun way to think about minimal cell. Um, certainly it takes engineering to fight physics, so why fight it if you can instead use it to your advantage? There um, is, uh, again, um, in the spirit of physics, starting with the simplest model, there's a model called the sp spontaneous curvature model for vesicles um, that we're looking into um, to see how well it can describe cell division for SYN3A. And, and if it's you know, superimposing that model onto our minimal cell, does that give us any hints as to what some of these genes of unknown function are doing? Now, there are two key physical parameters in this model. There's the volume to surface area ratio, and there's a spontaneous curvature of the membrane. Um, so we're looking right now, as I said, into which genes these parameters might depend on in this genomically minimal context. This can hopefully give us information on what these gene products are doing um, and get us closer to that vision for understanding what every gene in the cell is doing. So what else are people learning about this minimal cell? I mentioned there were a lot of groups working with it. Um, I know that it's, it's over 50 groups. Um, what's next? Well, I can say this is a very exciting time. We have whole cell models now of the minimal cell. Uh, I'm showing you here some of the papers that have come out recently. 
Other people are looking at its evolution. Um, still others are putting functions into the minimal cell that it never had to begin with, even before minimization, like the ability to move. Um, I, I'm very taken with this research because for most of the 20th century, we brought tools from physics and engineering and adapted them to measure living systems. And now with all of this biotechnological capability that we have, we're positioned to change our approach and instead adapt the living system itself to be more amenable to measurements. Now, in the case of a minimal cell, this might look like simply making a larger version of the cell so that it's easier to image on optical microscopes or a cell that adheres to a surface so that you can um, image it better and uh, manipulate it, change its environment without simply you know, flowing it away. Um, so those are simple things we can do. Um, Synthetic cells are another thing that's next. If you didn't know, there's an organization called Build a Cell. Um, you can join us there if you're curious to learn more about synthetic cells and the research um, ongoing to make them a reality. This is a great group of people. And um, you know there are opportunities for applications beyond the research lab. Um, if you can make synthetic genomes, you have the opportunity to make extensive, like whole cell, whole genome engineering, but you still have to get that genome into its target organism or express it somehow. So that's the challenge. We have, uh, I mentioned, uh, whole cell models for these organisms. So that should help with predicting yields and responses, you know, helping you uh, design some biomanufacturing workflow inside of your cell. But it is a challenge to figure out, um, you know, it's still a, a complex metabolic machinery. How do you expand the biochemistry beyond what the cell is already doing to include um, maybe a product of interest? Other folks are thinking about how to use the fact that the minimal cell was derived from an opportunistic pathogen as an advantage rather than as something maybe scary. <laughs> So um, you might imagine using the cell as uh, a therapy itself or for controlling the delivery of a therapy. But again, derived from an opportunistic pathogen, how do you ensure safety and efficacy? That's certainly a challenge. Um, these are early discussions. There's no obvious killer application for minimal cells yet. And I, I personally think that's, that's okay because no matter where we go with this particular minimal cell, building synthetic cells in general will inform and, ul and ultimately advance and require achieving that total mastery over cellular life that we mentioned earlier. Um, there's so much that we have to learn still. So it almost doesn't even matter what we do next. Um, and total mastery over, over cellular life, that's a really formidable challenge. So, so why bother at all? You know, some of us are driven by curiosity to take up challenges just because we can, like the urge to climb out Everest. You know, we want to understand what constitutes life and its inner workings. Some of us see the need for biotechnologists to solve pressing social problems that require the ability to control and engineer cellular function. Someone use biotechnology as a lens to experience more fully who we are and how we can live a meaningful life. Um, we even have a popular mythology in which the life force and cell-based transducers of this force play an essential role. And what might be next beyond these minimal cells? What more could we aspire to once we've gained full mastery over cellular life? We can also ask how might we take what we learn about life from a minimal cell and apply it to create living or lifelike attributes in non-biological systems? How might we go from machines like Atlas to machines with key attributes of life, like the character's data or the Tin Man? What would we gain? What would we lose? What are our responsibilities to our creations? What are their obligations to us? Who gets access to this technology? There are so many questions we can ask and so many issues to address. 
but these are for another day. I hope that you have a sense now for both uh, the recent technical progress and the greater context in which um, all of this work on minimal cells and cellular engineering is happening. Um, for now, I'd like to once again, thank all my collaborators. Um, and I'd like to thank you all for your attention. It's been, uh, as I mentioned, a, a real pleasure and honor to be here with you this evening. And um, I'm very happy to take any questions from you. Thank you. Well, thank you, Elizabeth. Uh, we have time now for our Q&A. So I guess I can start with a question that's a, a little bit of an oddball question. But since you were talking about designing computational systems in these cells, I'm a little bit familiar with Eric Winfrey's work, and I wondered if you could say a few words about how your work is different than what he's doing and maybe how it's the same or you build on each other and whether you talk to one another. Or... Great, great questions. Um, so his work um, was part of the inspiration for our RNA circuits. And, um, you know, I was a little bit disparaging of DNA circuits, and, and I shouldn't be because it's really an amazing technology. The big difference is that, in general, for DNA computations, you typically make the different molecular components of the computation in sort of separate tubes and then have to mix them together. They react once, and then that's it. You're done. Whereas ours, we kind of recruit the machinery of life to make the parts for us all together in situ. So they're reacting and being made and degrading sort of continuously. And I think there's a lot of potential for new capability there. Is he entirely in vitro or is he partly in vivo? I thought he had circuits in vivo. He was, uh, I forget what he was counting. It's been a while, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> There's a lot going on in, in your slides 44, 46, 48, and the your favorite one. Yes. <laughs> there's, there's a lot going on in that in that chamber. That one question I had is why is everything clustering at one end of the chamber? Is that great, fluid flow or great question? It, it's a very small amount of fluid flow, and that's because the polydimethylsiloxane that makes up three of the walls of these chambers, or the fourth wall is glass. Um, you can have evaporation through that. And so um, there's a very small fluid flow uh, into the bulk of the material. And that kind of leads to that clustering at one end. It's not like gravity doesn't matter at these scales. <laughs> so well, it's not that. I figured they were horizontal. So I, I didn't think it was gravity. It was quite a dramatic effect on where the cells are. I mean, the right end is is clear and the left end is you know, where all, all it, the material is. It, it so may be also, yeah, it may be also that um, the cells themselves stick to each other a little bit. And so, uh, you know, as they're the free cells are diffusing around, they may, they may start sticking to each other. Um, we have a polyl lysine uh, peg surface coating, just kind of that we, we pre-coat the chambers with. Um, and so the cells- things from sticking. Right, because without it, the cells just, just basically stay stuck. Uh, I, you know, for me, mycoplasmas are, are, a, te are a pest. <laughs> when I was doing cell culture, you know, they, you got mycoplasma and then that was a big problem. And, and they're nasty little beasts that you can't see. <laughs> and they're very, and then when you want them to grow, they're really hard to grow. So my question would be, uh, who, who's working on a different, is anybody doing like E. coli or trying something more ambitious or is it just, let's stick with this because it's so simple, and so minimal to begin with and we know how to culture it and manipulate it, so. Great questions. Um, so while there is a community of people using this reduced, this minimized mycoplasma, um, there are other folks who are trying to make uh, reduced or minimized versions of other organisms. Um, there are, uh, there's E. coli yeast. And, and I think there's, in, in general, people agree that, that what's gonna be most useful is not that there is one or, or a library of specific minimized cells, 
but that people are given the tools and a workflow and best practices for minimizing their organism of interest according to their selection criteria in their environments, because that's gonna be most useful. And then that'll enable people to do experiments where they only have as much biological complexity as they need to answer their question, fit for their purpose, rather than mucking around with all this complexity that is kind of just a nuisance or worse. So a related question, which, which I think is a you know, more fundamentally interesting question, is the, is the assumption or is it a hypothesis or is it taken as a, a given that there's only one minimal genomic complement for the minimum cell or there are, are many different um, minimal genetic complements that make living cells, but the somewhat different living cells, but you're still in the position where everything is necessary and only having all of those things is sufficient, but you get different varieties of cells with different sets, but they're all minimal sets, or there's only one minimum set. Thanks for bringing that up. Um, certainly, um, certainly uh, researchers in this area freely admit that there is no one minimal cell. And any cell is only minimal according to that minimization of workflow, those minimization criteria in, in that particular environment. And so one of the things that needed to happen for this particular minimal cell is that, um, and uh, I'm not sure if this is published yet, but uh, it needs a defined medium for growth. And the reason for that is that exactly what you point out, that there is an intimate relationship between a cell and its parts and the environment that cell is living in. And so it's almost nonsensical to say you have a minimal cell without also specifying the conditions under which it's living. You're airing I mean, all our dirty laundry here. I suppose, I suppose, well, that's the, the interesting stuff with me. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'm gonna ask one more question then we'll take some that came in from YouTube. Uh, and from the Q and A, so I remember my question here. Oh, you would you would, speaking of metrology, you would have to define conditions in which you define the minimum cell, right? So you could say it has to be. Um, I don't know. You have to define a simple carbon source and some other things, and say, okay, this is this is it. Our minimum environment. And it has to be able to function in that environment. Well, and, and this is part of a, a, a bigger discussion of what does it mean to have the same cell, right? If you, if you try to imagine that a cell is a reference material, you'd want to know that, you, any, that, that this reference cell is the same as that. So what would you even need to specify? And so there's a lot yes. of discussion in the community over, over not just uh, specifying protocols, but specifying the, the composition of, of a genetic part or a cell, like what, what would you need to tell somebody else so that they could arrive at the, the same, <laughs> big air quotes though, the same cell? So lots, of, lots of interesting questions. So David Rabinowitz, who is a longtime PSW member, and I believe he is a chemist by training. He has asked me to read this question. What has been learned about minimum requirements for metabolism, that is to say, obtaining energy from nutrients. I guess that circles back to the question we were just mentioning. So it's kind of a good segue is what nutrients and, and then what, what genes and proteins do you need? I'm, I'm going to have to uh, punt on this one because I am not an expert on the metabolism of a minimal cell. There are excellent papers published recently from um, Zan Luthi Schulten's group um, who are doing the modeling of the cell. So I'm going to refer you to a recent, I think it's a 2019 paper um, on the metabolic model for the cell. Uh, a question from the web, which I think is from our astronomer and PSW member, Carrie Liss. Carrie asks, is there any work being done along the lines you've described 
to try and improve the ethanol production from switchgrass metabolizing beasties. I think that's a little off the subject here, but. Well, I can't comment on that specific case, but I can comment more generally on cell-based biomanufacturing. And that's absolutely um, an area that NIST is interested in because of course, it's gonna support a large portion of our economy. Um, everybody wants to work, work towards more sustainable manufacturing um, that's not petroleum based. Um, and my hope is that there may be some opportunity for using minimal cells that have been engineered to function as living measurement systems and perhaps co-culture them or use them in some other way as um, part of a monitoring system in these biomanufacturing processes so that we can make them more competitive against uh, petroleum processes. I think actually that was one of Craig's projects that he got $600 million from ExxonMobil to engineer algae to produce fuel. There's been a lot of investment in this. Yeah, so there's a lot going on in that area. I don't know about switchgrass and, and uh, microorganisms, but- well, One of the big challenges now is that um, we can engineer the cells, um, but the challenge is going from a bench scale or, or a research lab scale to something that's scaled up to the hundreds or thousands of, you know, I don't even know how big, how many liters, vats, you know, fermentation vats um, for making industrial scale quantities of these things. Um, and that's not a transition that is typically easy or obvious. And uh, the United States is uh, hopefully investing in some facilities to support, um, to support that. Well, scale up can be a major problem in, in any process, especially chemical ones. They have terrible problems with scale up. I remember a story about um, somebody trying to purify an enzyme in, in Arthur Kernberg's lab, one of the enzymes involved in, in uh, DNA replication. And, and he, he got it to work great in a test tube and it had this little heating step mm. and he could never ever scale it up. So if he finally ended up doing 150 test tubes individually because the heat transport right. and other processes that were taking place, they just, you couldn't do it in a larger reactor. So we have another question from the web. This is from Jorge Aponte. He says, I saw a recommendation from National Academies about physics and biology working together to understand life. I think you're doing some of that. <laughs> How far are we from understanding the forces that affect the genesis of life? Excellent question. Um, I think we need to be careful because we can't ever really prove that we know what happened <laughs> in the hoary past. <laughs> um, all we can do is see if we can navigate this boundary between a pile of stuff and a pile of stuff that's alive, right? And one system for looking at that transition um, is cellular life. Others are looking at uh, materials that we don't usually associate with living systems, you know, to, to try to study that, that transition. But I, I think at the current state of knowledge, there's still a lot of, and magic happens, it's alive. <laughs> You know, I, I don't think that we know. Um, Jeremy England had published some papers a while ago. Um, I don't believe he's in science anymore. Um, looking at uh, seeing if thermodynamics and non nonlinear statistical mechanics um, can, can give us information on that. Um, I think that his theories uh, still need to be tested experimentally. Um, I haven't followed that work so closely, um, but that would be something to look at if you're interested in learning more. Um, you know, we're not there yet. There's, there's still a lot of room for, um, for interested and, and talented individuals to come and, and help us. I think, I think that's right. I think we're, we're not there yet. We've got, we've got fragmentary evidence on the earliest um, hints of life. We have some idea about the time when life evolved. Originally, 
what the conditions might have been, although there's kind of controversial lately as to what those conditions were. We have we had a talk by somebody who's looking at the most ancient fossil record of life, but um, and we haven't created life abiotic, from abiotic starting materials. And so we're, we're a ways away at this point. And there's a big raging debate about how you would know if you'd found life somewhere off of earth, Yes, and, you know, how you would define it. And we've yes. had a couple of talks on that. And especially Lee Cronin has given a talk I guess he never talked about his complexity, molecular complexity idea here, but um, that's just one idea. I, I think it's okay that we're a ways off though. You know, there's there's so much to be gained from still pushing towards that that moonshot, such as it's this. fine. It's the mystery of life, right? <laughs> well, I, I want to point out the mRNA vaccines as an example of what some of this, like, you know, the kind of impact. <laughs> the um, you know, transformative glow spanning um, that can be had from some of the biotech capability that comes from you know, fundamental research. <laughs> Enough from me, let's have a question from Carl Merrill. Carl is a professor emeritus and division head at uh, NIH. And I think he did some work on in the early days of taking bacterial genes and putting them into eukaryotic cells. So Carl, please ask your question. Well, I have two, two questions. One is very simple. You used the term cherry on slide 41, and I just wondered, what did that refer to? Uh, the, oh, I'm sorry, the fluorescent protein M-cherry. It's, it's what? The fluorescent protein M-cherry. Oh, That's oh I see. So it's, it's using fluorescent la labeling. Okay. And then the other question is more general, and that is... Um, these cells, the mycobacter, are, are simple cells. They require complex media. You can't just put them in simple chemicals. So one might say, are they really alive themselves, even in their, in their wild state? And that leads to the question, is there a continuum between them and a virus? I'm a big fan of continua. You know, um, I think that you bring up an excellent point as you get an organism that is simplified and unable to deal with a changing environment, you need an environment that's gonna accommodate that. Otherwise, is it alive, right? You know, if you put me on the moon, I'm not really alive anymore. <laughs> that's, not, that's not gonna work. Um, so I think that uh, more and more, there's a recognition that we need to be careful about talking about these organisms in a context, in an environment. I have a question from, uh, from, from Tim Thomas, another uh, longtime PSW member. So Tim, can you uh, unmute um, um, your mic and ask a question? Sure. Um, I'm wondering about whether or not viruses could infect your minimum cell. Could there be a minimum virus partner that would uh, always be there? Do you imagine such a thing could happen? Um, I can imagine it. Uh, I don't know, because keep in mind, I'm the physicist here. <laughs> I'm still learning the cell biology. This is, uh -huh. this is uh, um, part of my, my learning journey here. Um, so I defer to uh, somebody who's, who's more expert in, in the cell biology of the mycoplasmas, but, but certainly, um, certainly you can imagine uh, engineering other biological machines or biological parts that would complement the minimal cell in some way to make a system that would be suited to, I guess in your case, it would be asking questions about minimal viruses. <laughs> right, right, well, thank you. You know, uh, one comment along those lines is in all the DNA that they threw away, did they find, has anybody looked at it to see if there are signatures of, of uh, virus, viral DNA? Because there are some signatures of, of viral DNA. I'm not sure. That's a great question. Um, I do know that mycoplasmas um, mutate very rapidly, more rapidly than other organisms. Um, so, so that's something that folks are looking at. Um, if you do adaptive laboratory evolution with the minimal cell, what happens? What does that tell you about, you know, further minimization or, or um, the reappearance of function, for example. 
Um, I think these are open questions, but you know, we have all kinds of tool sets that we can throw the minimal cell at, and it's just really a, an exciting time. Well, here's a question that harks back, I think, to the beginning of your talk um, from the web. Uh, Jeffrey H. asks, do these minimum cells pose any risk to the public? So thank you for asking that. Um, they are classified as biosafety level two right now, um, mostly for agricultural reasons, because um, the derivative or the organism it's derived from is a, a goat pathogen. Um, but I can tell you that these cells are, you know, they, they don't live long on their own. They really require a very specific environment to grow. They grow slowly. They don't have cell walls. They lice very easily. Um, so no, they don't. Um, and in fact, I, I believe in Germany, they were reclassified as BSL-1. Yeah. So, and another thing I want to bring up is that more more generally in cellular engineering and engineering biology, synthetic biology, um, whenever you engineer a function into a cell, the cell is generally unhappy with that function. You know, it's a very tuned system for what it's evolved to do. And when you perturb that, it has mechanisms for ejecting what you're trying to make it do, right? Ejecting those parts or ejecting that function. So that can, it can increase its fitness. Um, so biocontainment is of course a concern uh, and it should be taken seriously. But in general, the engineered cells that we make tend to be sicker than natural cells. They tend not to do well um, outside of the laboratory. Another question from Carrie Liss, which I'll read. Didn't Jeremy England argue that life arises naturally in a driven off equilibrium system in order to maximize entropy production. If so, I'm surprised no one has tried to set up an artificially driven system to see if new life could be generated. But contamination by existing biota is probably a big problem and also with such an attempt. So has anybody tried that? Not to my knowledge. I hope I'm wrong because I would love to read that paper. <laughs> So I'm going to ask uh, one more question anyway. Well, actually, I asked two. So in that zoo of things that we saw in your favorite video, yes. have you characterized all of them? There seem like there are filaments, there are small, what look like vacuoles and large vacuoles. I couldn't really tell those. Some of them are ovoid shaped. Are they two-dimensional or three-dimensional? I think yeah. later on you showed a, a lipid vesicle, so maybe they're three-dimensional. But could you just say a little bit more about what, what's in that zoo? Yeah, we don't, we don't know. Okay. And part, part of the reason is that- You need more, more graduate students. <laughs> well, we also need different devices. So um, I mentioned that our devices are three microns deep and that's for reasons of being able to load the cells. If we design different devices, we could design them to image these different um, structures more clearly longer, better. Um, one thing I didn't mention is that performing these experiments in the fluidics was actually very challenging. And it took two of us pretty much running all over the lab for you know a good 15 hours straight. <laughs> oh, boy. Yeah. Because you have all the complexities of the imaging, all of the complexities of the biology, and then all the complexities of the fluidics and they all have to work together. Um, I'm sure we can do better if we went back and tried again. Um, we simply ran out of time and money. Um, so, so what else could we do? Um, we could bring other measurement techniques to these cells. We could, we could use, um, and people want to, um, super resolution microscopy techniques. Um, different kinds of fluorescent or other labels, hyperspectral imaging. Um, some people are looking at um, some uh, scanning probe measurements that we can maybe, maybe do. Um, I, I think in the next few years, we'll see a lot of uh, papers come out that give us information on what these structures are, where they come from, what they're made of. 
Uh, yeah. Unfortunately, we don't we don't have that yet. You have lots of questions and lots of things to do. So I'm going to let you go back to the lab soon. And um, thank you so much for giving this lecture, and especially for uh, providing us with an overview of the experiments you're doing and the and the data that you're getting and and some of the aims that you have. So really appreciate it. Um, thanks so much. I look forward to you coming back in a couple of years with an update. And maybe then you'll be able to tell me what all those things are in that, in that chat. I hope so. I hope so. Thank you. So thanks so much. Before you go, just a few things to tell you. Our next lecture, meeting number 2458, will be on May 6th. And the speaker will be Rahul Saini. He is the CEO of Teleatry, the MEMS director at Nano Retina the Director of Micro and Biosystems at Zyvex Laboratory, and CTO at NXT STEM, which makes me wonder how he has time to talk to us, but he will be here on the 6th, and he'll be speaking about implantable electronic devices set to revolutionize certain aspects of medical care, illustrated by an implantable retina now in clinical trials, and an implantable Vegas nerve stimulator being used to control epileptic seizures, among other things. We are planning for this meeting to be in person, but again, that ultimately will be determined by COVID and COVID-related measures in place in two weeks. His lecture will be followed by the annual Joseph Henry Lecture at meeting number 2,459. The speaker will be Bob Ballaram of JPL Caltech. He is the chief engineer of Ingenuity and he will be speaking on Ingenuity, the first flying machine on Mars. On June 3rd, the speaker will be Charles Dehan. Charles is head of quantum computing at the White House Office of Science and Technology Policy and chief scientist at the Laboratory of Physical Sciences. He'll be speaking about quantum computing and the National Quantum Computing Initiative. The 2,461st meeting will be on June 17th. The speaker will be Shobita Satyapal. She is professor of physics and astronomy at George Mason University and she will be speaking about supermassive black holes. And that will conclude the spring lecture series. The fall lecture series will kick off with meeting number 2,462 on September 9th. The speaker will be Drew Weissman of the University of Pennsylvania. He will be speaking about mRNA vaccines. Drew is one of the two people who develop chemical modification methods that make these vaccines possible. Please check the PSW website often for up-to-date information on meetings and whether lectures will be in-person or via Zoom. COVID and COVID-related public health measures are constantly changing and PSW is adjusting plans accordingly. We hope you will join us for these meetings, whether they are by Zoom or in person. Finally, let's thank Tonight's speaker, uh, <laughs> tonight's volunteers for producing this meeting, Robin Taylor, who in the background here is doing the live stream and is responsible for the audio visual. James Hewen, who read the, prepared and read the minutes, and McQueen, who handled the YouTube questions, and our friends. With that, I will adjourn the 2,457th meeting of the society and wish everyone a good morning, evening, afternoon, or night, wherever you may be. The meeting is adjourned.